Thanks, everyone. Um, that was a bit of a mouthful of a title, and probably not the mouthful you want when it's given it's lunchtime, so I'll try and uh, break it down for you. So, so essentially, uh, what I'm going to talk about is a collaboration that we did at Goldsmiths in the psychology department. Goldsmiths is a college in the University of London, uh, and we did this in collaboration with an audio branding agency called Ivy Audio, based out in Nashville. Um, and it was the collaboration between two different research ideas. So at Goldsmiths, we are interested in similarities in the music experience, um, particularly of listeners, and we were trying to understand to what extent listeners uh, as a general population can build systematic codes, perhaps semantic codes, from musical properties and how we use those. Separately, Steve at Ivy Audio uh, was doing a lot of uh, music-based work in our archetypes, sorry, using um, music and archetypes-based branding and communications work. And what he found was some link between the music that was being used, the archetypes they were trying to perceive, but he couldn't find any empirical evidence to support that intuition. So we thought that there might be a good idea to, contribute, uh, to take these two ideas together and see if we could come up with a study to find something practical and, and useful for practitioners. So what do we mean by musical semiotics? Um, so essentially, we're still talking about the study of signs, um, how they generate meaning, um, and ultimately how we can use that to generate a level of understanding. But the challenge with music is that we haven't historically, or, or even today, we don't use music explicitly in, in a communicative fashion in the way that we use language or perhaps visuals. So uh, we don't necessarily learn it that way either. So the question is, to what extent could we be learning some kind of system that is generalizable? Um, and then if we have that, can we show evidence that it's actually used and employed that way? Uh, broadly speaking, there are two different approaches to music semiotics. You've got the more musicology-based approach. Uh, you may be familiar with work by Iro Terasti or Jean-Jacques Nettier. Um, those tend to be very intense semiotic readings of very complicated pieces of music, typically classical music, and that music already has a very explicit narrative source. Um, so they're doing a very specific reading of a specific piece of music from a narrative source. On the other hand, you find in multimedia studies, they are looking at uh, cross-modal um, studies of all the different aspects across um, kinesthetics, visual, musical, text, seeing what underlying systems there might be, how you might encode those things, and then how they might relate to each other. And it was from that body of research that we were trying to draw some inspiration. So you might find some really simple examples of uh, music semiotics, like a musical icon. So if I were to play you one of these melodies here that you can see, uh, you'd hear sort of an undulating contour of a melody, and you'd probably very easily associate that with something like an undulating form, like waves or arches. Um, it would be very congruent from a visual representation, like drawing a, a wavy line, or even the notes on the staves here. Where it gets more complicated is when you think about whole pieces of music. So you can have arbitrary associations from culture, such as uh, Richard Strauss's um, Alsace Sprague Zarathustra, and its association with space but it's not inherent in the properties of the piece of music that you would get that association. That's because of Stanley Kubrick. All right, so, so there is this cultural association there. But then, and hopefully I can play a bit, we could have a look at a, a car ad. Let's see if this works. Jeff, is this definitely hooked up to the Wi-Fi? Is it definitely gonna be hooked up to the Wi-Fi? Okay, so um, hopefully that piece of music was relatively novel to most of you here, so you've never heard it before. And if I were to ask you to think about an archetypal figure, perhaps some kind of stock character that you could infer from that music, the chances are you'd be thinking of something along the lines of a rebel or an outlaw, something like that. So the question is, what was it about the piece of music, forgetting the visuals for a second, what was it about the music that helped you make that inference? Is it to do with the type of instrumentation used? Was it to do with certain parts of the structure? Could it be to do with the way the guitar was being played? So the way they would, he was doing the, or she was doing the slurs or the bends. Um, so it's those sorts of symbols we're trying to look at and see, can we, can we find something systematic there? Uh, so I mentioned archetypal figures. So the question here is, um, why were we interested in archetypes in the first place? So I think in general, archetypes are interesting because they, uh, they're used as a framework for understanding commonalities within culture and cultural output. And as psychologists, we're in, in looking at meaning, we're interested in culture in general because it's both the way we express ourselves in various medium, media, rather, but also the way that we 
and use that as a source of knowledge to build up our own systems of how the world operates and how the world works. So it's how we inform our, our, um, the knowledge we use to make sense of the world in general. Um, in particular, uh, we were referred to some of the work by Mark and Pearson within branding and communication. And what we found interesting here was their synthesis of some of the most common themes that we respond to as individuals in this, um, this sort of wheel of 12 archetypal figures. So this is something that came out of their, their research. We understand that it's not exhaustive of all the things that we could relate to, but if it does reflect the most common themes, then it should be something that as a population we generally all recognize to some degree, um, and therefore something that we could actually test, um, operationally test in, a, in an experiment. So how can we link the two ideas uh, of archetypes and, and musical semiotics? And hopefully what I'm going to describe does tie in with some of the other the semiotic theory that you've been talking about in the past day or two. Um, so I'm borrowing here from a model by a woman called Annabel Cohen, and this is called the congruence association model. And the idea of the model is you have the scene that's playing out in front of you, so that's represented at the bottom, and you've got all these different um, surfaces with different um, audiovisual sensory information, and actually thinking about something someone mentioned yesterday, you could probably include olfactory information there as well. But we also have long-term knowledge and, and understanding of what those different systems are. And we bring those two things into the middle and we create this thing called a working narrative. And it's the process of creating a working narrative that allows us to get to this ultimate sense of understanding. By virtue of that process, it means that a, the signs are acti acting cross-modally. So a kinesthetic sign can correspond to a visual sign or a musical sign and so forth. So there should be an interaction happening in working narrative to arrive at that understanding. Uh, applying that to uh, music, if we were to focus on the musical surface alone and look at some of the underlying properties of that music, as listeners, we should be drawing on those first into our working narrative. But then as we draw down from long-term memory, we should be drawing from different modalities as well as a result of that, that relationship. And what that should allow us to do is make some relative perceptual judgments. And in this case, we were looking at whether something could be more jester-like, more heroic, or perhaps less sage-like, less lover-like. So we're looking at these relative perceptual judgments, though, of course, there are examples where you could find absolute judgments of um, uh, something within music and one of those characters. So essentially, we're asking three questions as part of the study. Um, is there a systematic use of, of psychoacoustic musical properties to be able to communicate archetypal figures in the first place? If so, can listeners use the same structures to recognize those archetypal figures if they just hear the music alone? Um, and if those properties are in some way communicative or predictive of that communication, how can we uh, see their relationships with some other semantic categories from music psychology? And most of that will come from studies of mood or affect or emotion. Uh, so I'll briefly talk about how we ran the study, but essentially all you need to know is we did three things. So the first thing is we interviewed 22 composers. We asked them to think about how they would manipulate different properties within music for a range of different archetypes. Uh, we then analyzed the data, and we looked for areas of high and low agreement between those composers. And that allowed us to build some really high-level models of what music could be more lover-like or more heroic. Um, in terms of uh, how we had to limit the study for operational feasibility, we only focused on three archetypes. So we focused on the jester, the lover, and the sage. And we only used five musical properties in the end. And those are uh, tempo, so the speed of the music, um, how loud or quiet it was, if there were lots of dynamic changes, um, if it had a narrow or a broad pitch range, uh, and finally, how dull or bright the sound of the music was. Uh, we then had to find some, some clips that could fit these high-level models. So we took 600 songs from a commercial music library. These were pieces of music from familiar Western styles, but a variety of Western styles. Nothing that was commercially popular or well-known, and um, there was no lyrical content in any of the music. We then broke those down into small 19-second clips, and then we used some techniques called music information retrieval that just allowed us to quantify those different measures, those different properties. And from that, we got a list of 138 stimuli to put into these models, and we could test those. And the testing bit was just to get participants to listen to those clips and very quickly make a judgment about how well-suited that, that clip would be for each of six archetypal figures. And we actually used six just to have a much more balanced range for them to think about, rather than just focusing on, focusing on the three that we created the clips for. Uh, there's probably a couple of things to, to briefly touch on in terms of what we mean by some of the, uh, the way we put the experiment together. One thing is around these models or these configurations I've mentioned. So I talked about high and low agreement between composers. 
Uh, high agreement just means something like the red bars, so their ratings were really closely um, clustered together. And low agreement means there was a much bigger distribution in the way they would use that property. So in the case of Sage, for example, we had four properties where all the composers had really high agreement on how they'd use them. So we could keep those quite consistent. But in the case of uh, brightness, they couldn't agree whether it should be duller or brighter. So that allowed us to create two different models for Sage, uh, and then we could test those. Uh, the other thing we wanted to, to test was whether this could be generalizable to a population. So we did the study twice. We first did it in more controlled settings with 48 people, and they each listened to 69 clips. And then we replicated it online uh, with 145 people, different population, uh, but they only listened to 23 clips each. Ultimately, the idea was to get about 24 uh, ratings for each clip in each experiment, and then we could analyze the data um, alongside each other and then see, look for comparisons to see how replicable it was. So I'm going to talk about just three highlights in the study, which hopefully are things that you would find interesting. Uh, the first thing is this question around, well, is it a communicative tool or not? And is what composers intended what listeners actually perceived? So at a high level, we found in seven of the nine uh, configurations or models, we found that the results showed that um, if you intended it to be something more jester-like, then th the listeners would actually find it more jester-like compared to the other archetypes. But one thing to bear in mind is um, we have some examples, such as in the top graph, where they may have found it more jester-like, but they couldn't make any distinction between whether it was more sage or lover-like. So it generally fit the model, but there wasn't a distinction between all three of those characters. But if you look at the middle graph, which was one of the more sage-like categories, you can see there's a very clear distinction between each of those characters. So a really low for jester, somewhere in the middle for lover, but really high for sage. And then in two cases, we found that the profile ratings of ratings were pretty flat, so there was nothing significant there. Uh, I'm now going to talk about two of the properties that we found most interesting and most predictive in, um, in, the, in the studies, both from composers and listeners. Uh, so the first one is tempo. Um, so we found that uh, faster tempo would correspond more with more jester-like um, music and slow tempo with more lover or sage-like music. What I've done at the bottom is taken some examples of word choice um, correlations between uh, those, the fast or slow tempo um, and these descriptors of um, mood or affect, which have come from the, the body of literature that already exists. So I'm going to play brief bits of a clip of each, just so you can get an idea of, of the music we used. But you can think about those words in relation to the archetypal figure as you're, you're listening. So I'll start with Jester, hopefully. Move on to Lover. And last one, Sage. talk about one other um, property, and that's timbre brightness. Um, it's just to explain what brightness means, it's essentially a way of looking at the energy within the music and deciding, um, and actually it relates to the sound of instruments and how those instruments relate to each other in those sounds. So typically a brighter sounding instrument would be something like brass or trumpets. Um, it could be um, stringed instruments in, in a higher register. It could be an acoustic guitar. Um, duller music is actually something like a piano, for example. So a piano could, is considered to have a duller timbre of brightness, um, or very kind of uh, uh, experimental ambient type music. So we found two interesting things here. Uh, the first is, in terms of brightness, uh, jester and lover tended to correspond to brighter sounding instrumentation, and sage with duller sounding instrumentation. But if you listen to the way those instruments are played, you find in the jester category, there's a much sharper attack to the notes. So we could refer to things such as um, staccato or, or pizzicato. Pizzicato is a way of playing a stringed instrument, but you pluck rather than using a bow. So there's a sharp attack to the sound that, that's produced. Whereas in the lover case, it tended to be more bowed strings, or what you'd refer to as a legato um, expression. So again, I'll play, try and play a clip from each. <laughs> 
and finally the Sage example. One thing to bear in mind is if when we looked through all the different, um, the d different clips that rated very highly for Sage and li looked at brightness, we found there was a lot of uh, ambient or electronic instrumentation which hasn't actually really been studied in a lot of, a lot of formal musical music psychology studies of timbre and how they would define that in, a, in space with conventional instrumentation. So for that reason, I haven't been able to provide more other examples for you of, of, um, within the literature of, of other terms. Uh, I think that's all for the clips. Um, so, I to conclude then, um, are we saying that there is such a thing as musical semiotics that you, you can use to encode archetypes? Given that this is the first study we know of that has ever tried to look at this, um, what I would say is we've got some promising evidence that, that this exists, but you have to bear in mind we only used five properties for this, and we only looked at three archetypes. However, I think the experiment shows there is something which is generalizable. There is a system or a framework here that we could reuse within different cultures and different populations, bearing in mind we only use this for a Western audience, um, mostly UK-based, um, but it is something which is reproducible as a framework. Um, I think it's encouraging that we can see some congruency in other semantic categories from music psychology, such as mood and affect. And I also think there's quite an exciting opportunity to think about how you extend this idea of archetypes. So we looked at figures here, but you have to place figures within a scene or a narrative. So you can think about archetypal plots, or you can think about crisis points or turning points within um, a, narrative, a narrative arc and think about how music might inform that part of the narrative in which you're placing a protagonist, such as a hero, for example. Um, I think that's, that's everything. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. It's really exciting to think we might be on the verge of having some ways of decoding music semiotically, so this is very promising. Any questions from the floor? Ed, so, Ed, it, yeah. Just a quick one. So there's else. If I want to learn more about this, I ask you, no one else. <laughs> <laughs> So I, we're not aware of anyone who's looked at, um, systematically tried to look at other types of semantic um, content outside of mood and affect. You might find in multimedia studies, and, and the book I referred to earlier is a really good um, uh, compendium, a really good synthesis of some of the work there, but they're looking at things, um, congruency of within film, for example, theatre, um, and, and, and so they're kind of demonstrating that these things do exist. But actually looking at something which is more applied, um, I've not come across anything. So um, yes, but I'm not sure how much I can give, what I can give you right now. Uh, Olivia, Professor Bresak has a question. Oh. Sorry, you, you can do empirical research in actual film, how it is used in this, but there is a domain in which you could find very raw uh, data, which is in the circus. Right. Because you have music which is adapted to heroic behavior, yes. romantic behavior, dramatic behavior, Absolutely. and things like that. So that there is a way to approach it from the way it is actually uh, implemented. A absolutely. So, so I think, and I think there is a lot of literature already that shows you can apply music in different contexts, um, and you can have that interplay between in congruency or incongruency. And in some cases, the incongruency is what makes it um, gives you the impact, right? So it's about understanding how, it's being aware of how you're applying it. What we were trying to do here is, given that, that that body of literature exists, and we know we can do that, it's actually understanding, going beyond things like um, anger, fear, disgust, uh, high level emotions, is there something else that people use in the field as a semantic category, which we actually do respond to as, as, as an audience, as consumers, as, as listeners, and can we first show that there is a relationship there absent of any other context, because if you can establish that, then it means that you can then apply it to a multitude of contexts, including things like the circus, and I think that's a really great example. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Okay, one more question from Karen. Yeah, yes, a, a comment that we're, we're using uh, archetypal uh, testing, quantitative testing at marketing research. Uh, 
company. And we can see that if we change the music for um, TVC, for example, mm -hmm. it gives the respondents choose a different archetype. So it's mm -hmm. even dominant to the visuals. Yeah. They, they comprehend the visuals differently depending on the music. So yes, absolutely. there is absolutely a connection. Yeah. And, and it can work both ways, by the way. So there is some yeah. evidence that um, visuals can change the perception of the actual sound of music as well to do with how quickly or hard someone attacks a note, for example. So th there is some evidence of, of, it, of it going both ways. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Christian. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to break for some much deserved lunch. Um, and today you're on your own to explore the neighborhood.